morning and welcome to The Rock here in Pine Town. And it's good to see some visitors here this morning. We'd like to, I just thank our sister and, and, and the brother here for coming along. And we do appreciate uh, everyone who comes along. The, you know, the church is a family. And, and it's not just an organization. It's not an, it shouldn't be an organization. It should be a coming together. The word is ecclesia. Ecclesia, what ecclesia means in the Greek? It means coming together, the gathering together. So it's the gathering together of believers is the church. It's not the building. It's the people who come. The people who come are the ecclesia or the church. Now, people will say, oh, well, I watch it on YouTube, and I'll watch it there, and I'll watch it everything. Um, I, I'm also part of the church. And the answer to that question is, yes, you are. You are part of the church, but you're not the church because the church is, means, literally means gathering together. If you're watching it somewhere else and you're not in the gathering place, you're not in church. You're part of the church, but you haven't gone to the church, which is the gathering of people. And it's we're warned about the forsaking of it. And it's great having all the electronic stuff, and we can do WhatsApp, so we can do YouTubes. But there's nothing, nothing can replace the gathering of the people so that we can come together and we can worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but Jesus together. We can be here, and we can comfort one another, we can laugh with one another, and we can share each other's issues. It's great, and it's, it's an upliftment. And, and I must admit, I, I enjoy, I enjoy talking. I, I, you know, when I speak at different places, like funerals and whatever, you know, sometimes it's like talking to cardboard cutouts. You know, people are just... But it's nice to see people. You're allowed to smile. You're allowed to laugh. It's not a place where we've got, where we've, oh, no, we can't laugh. Of course you can laugh. That's the way God made us. He made us with a sense of humor. But some people don't come to church. And a lot of people make it for, oh, there's too many hypocrites in church. You know, as you know, I've been in a hospital recently. And uh, I didn't want to go there. And when I came out of the hospital, I had an operation. I like the way they say it. It'll be non-invasive surgery. What is non-invasive surgery? They put you under anesthetic. You drill a hole in your stomach. They stick a camera in. They poke all around inside. They cut out what they don't like. Pull it out again. Plaster you up. It was non-invasive. Well, I wouldn't like to to get an invasive surgery. But that's the way it is. And, and that's, you know, it's great to be out. And people say, oh, no, you know, when I came out, the only thing that, that now I'm concerned about now is my voice disappeared. Now, I know you're saying praise God for that, you know. But my voice disappeared. And, and when I came out at first, I just came out of the operation. Now, and, you know, you're coming around out of, out of a general anesthetic. And let's be honest, you don't feel like as if, hey, it's party time. And I just was waking up, and I thought, oh, I feel like death. My shoulders, there was a pain across my shoulders. Uh, my mouth was so dry, I couldn't talk. I felt dreadful. People who have been through this understand what I'm talking about. Also, my wife turned up within about 10 minutes of me getting back into the ward. That was the last thing, I'm, bless you, that was the last thing I wanted to see was a visitor. Any visitor, I just wanted to lie there and get come come right. And to top of that, the gentleman, there was only three in the ward, the gentleman across from me was deaf. And he wanted to know how I was. And I couldn't speak to I couldn't even whisper to him. And I couldn't signal to him. I, I just told him, he said, he says, no. So I put my earphones in, plugged it into my cell phone, and pretended I couldn't hear him anyway. Good Christian. But you know, going to hospital, people don't like going to hospitals because you can catch a bug. Do you know why? Because there's sick people in the hospital. That's why. And people don't want to come to church. Why? Because there's hypocrites. Well, you know what? We have had a few sinners come to us and pass our time. But that's what the church is about. It's re reaching out to all people and to everybody. Right. So we must let it go. We must let certain things go that are in our lives, things that we dwell on, things that we shouldn't dwell on. And, and what are these things? Well, we have all got a past. We've all got a history. We've all got 
something of some sort of baggage that we're, we're, we're dragging along. And you know what? Sometimes we really got to let that go. You see, I look at my life, and, and I, don't, I don't look at other people. I look at my life, and in my life from an early age, and when I'm talking an early age, I mean like early, early age. I, made, I, could, I can remember mistakes that I made. And I remember continuing making mistakes. And you know, when I reflect on that, it, uh, it, it gives me a feeling of, gee, how could you be so stupid to do those things? Even from an earlier, and I thought, oh, wow. But on the other hand, it can help you when you do reflect. You, you know, we, we have got to look at it. And Paul says in Philippians 3, verse 8, he says, more than that, and I remember Apostle Paul he was a Pharisee. He was one of the top students. He knew the he knew the Hebrew scriptures inside and out. He knew everything. He was the most zealous guy that was running after Christ. He was running after the disciples to persecute them, to kill them. He stood there while Stephen was being stoned. Stephen was standing there being stoned, and he said, I see Christ standing at the right-hand side of, 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 of the Father. And, and Paul was there. Paul didn't believe it. He actually went and got an, a, a, an interdict to go and chase after all the Christians that were around the place and to persecute them. And the Christians did get persecuted, and they, got per they paid for it with their lives. But Paul then, he comes on. When he writes the letter to, to the church at Philippi, and he says to the Philippians, more than that, I count all things loss. And other things, everything I've done, all the achievements I've made, all the academic achievements, everything I've done, I count all things lost in view, view of what? Of, my, of the surpassing value. He's now received Jesus Christ. The surpassing value of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Now, this is the thing. People can be, they can, they can say, all right, I believe in Christ, but is he your Lord? Wow, what's that mean? Is he your master? Do you consult him before you do anything? And the answer is, unfortunately, a lot of us don't. We just, we actually, you know what we do? We try to create Jesus in our image, and we're supposed to be created in his image. And we try to get him to fit in with our plans and just rubber stamp things we do. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Paul says he has lost all things in his past, and he counts them but rubbish, and in fact it's dung. That word rubbish in Greek can be translated as manure. And the rubbish that they're talking about, the garbage, remember back in those days they didn't have plastic waste, and they didn't have cans, and they didn't have all that sort of stuff. Most of their waste was like vegetable uh, it could be meat stuff, and it was taken out through a gate called the dung gate. And so therefore, he says, I count all those things like as rubbish in order that I gain Christ. So he's gained. He's made a loss, but he's gained. What did he lose? He's lost his loss. Now, okay, um, someone today said, um, uh, uh, I can speak Irish. Well, here's, here's one for you. They're speaking the Irish, a loss of a loss is a gain. Does that make sense? So all the things he has lost, that loss has let him gain Christ Jesus. We can take that rubbish, we can look at our past and think, well, I count it as dung. We can go, I count it as manure. But when you come, what, what do you do with manure? I remember my dad years ago, he used to grow roses. And he, the, the, he used to put the, the horse's manure around the roses and water them, and the, the roses would come up smelling like roses. <laughs> Fortunately. <laughs> and... <clears throat> We can use that. We can use our past to fertilize our future. We can use our past to give us, we know we've made that, we've been that, we've seen the mistakes we've made. We're now going to correct those mistakes, and we're going to live a life that's honorable to Christ. And not only that, but we can actually take that uh, and, and the, the fertilizer, and if we think, oh, no, well, I've done enough, I can't do any more, you can use it for other people. You can take your experiences, your past experiences, your past mistakes, your past triumphs, and you can use them to help other people. And that's what I find is so important. So, what do we hold on to? If we're going to let things go, what do we hold on to? What we've got to hold on to, and you've got to really think about it, is to holding on to the rest, the rest that we have, the relaxation, the, the, the normality, the peace of mind that we find in Christ Jesus. And that's the only rest we have. We find it in Christ Jesus. And I must admit, that when you're in hospital waiting for an operation, your prayer life really improves. 
It really improves. And I can be honest with you, I felt the presence of God, and I heard him when he knew my troubles. I heard him. I heard him instinctively, not audibly. And I heard him give me peace, and I heard him give me rest. So now we, we talk on to the rest, and we talk on about the security that we have in Jesus and the security we have in our salvation. Now, the security we have is only in him. And, you know, people, I remember growing through, we went through all the ages, we went through, remember the charismatic churches, and all of a sudden the, the traditional churches became charismatic churches, and the, the, uh, we got excited, yo, you know, the Spirit of God is moving, and, and it was, and it, we, we went through all of that. But one thing I really battled with, and it was a term that we used, or people used, and it wasn't a very nice term, it was called eternal security. And people, oh, you believe in eternal security. You know, once saved, always saved. Ha, 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 that's impossible. You lose your salvation. Well, I can honestly tell you that you don't. You don't. Once you are saved, you are safe, you are secure. You are with the Lord. Oh, but what if I drift away? You are like a child of, if, I, if any of my children, I have five, if any of my children, all grown up, some of them ugly, but anyway, but if I, they've all grown up, and if they go away and they go off the track, they're still my child. I still love them. And how much more will God love us? Jesus actually says it in, in John 10, verse 28. He says, my sheep, I give eternal life. He said that. My sheep, I give eternal life. Who's his sheep? Right? He's talking about the Jews. No, he's not. He's talking about those who listen to his voice. He only says, no one can pluck them out of my hand. And I used to come up with an argument, ah, but I could jump out. Really? When he says no one, he's talking about you as well. No one. Why? Because of the grass. It's impossible. The grass he's got on you is, a, is what's known in the Bible as a covenantal grasp. He has made a covenant with Father God that he would die, that his blood would be for our sake. Now, these two are doing it. Father God and Jesus, who is God, they, they, he said that, that my blood will be acceptable. Jesus is not only the mediator, he has mediated. He has mediated. He's the bridge that brings us mankind to God. And we're going through that period of time now where we are on this earthly process. And when Jesus inaugurated the covenant, because God said in Jeremiah 30, 31, he said, I'm going to put a heart of flesh into my people. And what he meant there was that he is no longer, it's no longer written in stone, but it's written in your heart and in your inner being and in your soul and your psyche right inside. You know, I look back over my life and I can see things that I would have done years ago. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even think about doing today. The violence, the, the actions, the stuff, never. I would never even contemplate it. In fact, I would turn away and walk away from a situation that I didn't like. Jesus inaugurated this covenant on the cross. He took us, but he died and, 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 and he was buried. He was dead. But the resurrection showed that the quickening of the spirit is there. And, and we, we when, we, when we pass on, our, our bodies will be quickened. We will be, we will be with the Lord spiritually, and then we will be with the Lord with our new body, and the Bible tells us that. So Jesus was the, the bridge, and he has got the grasp. He's got the grasp on us, and he will never let us go. It doesn't matter how bad you feel. It doesn't matter how emotional you feel. It doesn't matter how down you feel. It doesn't matter what you're going through. He has got you, and he will not let you go. He will not let you go. Now, I want to look at, 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 at a parable. Um, and this, this parable, um, it, it, you think it's got nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Because when I'm saying let it go, let the things in the... Don't carry your burdens. Don't carry your guilt. Don't carry your past. Don't carry any of that into your future. Uh, you take it now in the present and you accept it and you, you embrace it and say, that's what I was like. No more. I can see that. And now the stuff and the mistakes and all that stuff I had, I'm going to now take it into my future. It's going to help me on a spiritual level, and I can help other people 
on a spiritual level. But on that, I just want to do, uh, I want to have a look at something. And here we go with, it's called, it's Luke 12, verse 13 through to verse 20. And it's called the parable of the rich fool. Now, this parable is usually only uh, spoken about by ministers, pastors, evangelists who are trying to get money into the church. Far be it from me to do that. I want to show you something else that you want to let go of. And I want to show you something else that maybe Jesus is talking about. I believe, this has been on my heart for a while. I, I will admit, this, is, this, this particular thing has been on my heart for a while. So I want to show you, he's standing, he comes, and he's got a crowd around him. And in the crowd, you've got someone who shouts at him a question. And the question is, Someone in, the crowd said, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. I've got a problem, Lord. I've got a problem with my brother. He's got an inheritance, and I need some of it. If you tell him, you, Jesus, if, we'll, we'll bring it to you. If you tell him, hey, it'll be okay. Let's, let's do that. And Jesus said, <laughs> and this is the bit I love, he said, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? What? In other words, sort it out yourself. It's your responsibility. We can't jump to every, if you, when you are here, you've got a responsibility in this life, in this world. And you know, Jesus said, so, so this guy going, hey, teacher, hey, tell my brother, Coming from you, it'll, it'll go down. Jesus, who called me as a judge or an arbiter between you? Who appointed me? The answer was no one. He wasn't appointed to be the judge. He wasn't appointed to be an arbiter. He was there. He was there to teach them about the kingdom of God. And that's, you know what? That's what we're here for. We're called to teach about, just to speak about the kingdom of God. We're not, we're not here to, to judge people. That's the problem. There's, you know, there's too many judges, not enough witnesses. Then he said to them, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Immediately you think of money. But let me think about something else. Not just money. We're talking about covetedness. Not being content with what you've got. All kinds of greed. Not just one. Everything around I've been blessed, I've been blessed, I've been blessed, but Lord, I need more. All kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. In other words, what you've got on this earth, you could be a multimillionaire. I know I'm not talking to anybody here like that. If you could be a multimillionaire, you could have all the latest motor vehicles, you could have everything at your fingertips. But that's not what you're made up of. You're made up of your psyche, which is your soul, and that's what's important. Your possessions, when you die, you're not going to take them with you. Not at all. I know the, the, the years ago, the Egyptians, they used to get buried with a lot of stuff. But it makes no difference. We've got to be careful. And he told them this parable. Now, here's the parable. The ground of a certain rich man, so the man was already rich, yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I've no place to store my crops. Hey, but wait a minute, he said. This I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you've got plenty of grain laid up for many years. And here's the bit we all like to hear. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. Right? What? I've, I've done it. I've, I'm a rich man. I've got that. Now, what I've got to do, I've got more than I need. So I'm going to pull all those barns down. But why don't you give some away? No, no, no. I'm going to pull the barns down, and I'm going to store, make bigger barns so that I can, hey, I'm going to sit back and relax now. Hey, it, payday is here, and it's not going away. Of course, until God speaks to him. But God said to him, you fool, 
This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Wow. This very night. It just shows you the gift of God is breath. You know, and that, when that breath stops, God is no longer there. He's gone. What have you done? Oh, well, I've done, I've got this amount of money. I've got that. I've, I've got farms. I've got property. I've got, I've got the latest motor vehicles. I've got all of these things. You fool. You've let up your treasures on earth, not in heaven. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you've prepared for yourself, spiritually speaking, the eternal life. You know, it's, it's normal to grab hold of lots of things. But when you die, you, 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 know, you just can't take it with you. See, it's Jesus is saying, it's not what you have. It's not what you own. It's not your position. It's not, your, it's not what you do when it comes to the material world. It's not, not in the flesh. But it's what happens in eternal life. Have you prepared a way? Thank God that you know, Jesus has become a... He's become, literally become a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. And that is what I want. And do you know why I say that? And everybody said, oh, well, that's right. You know, don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Look straight up. Yes, we all agree with that. And yet of all, I've never seen an era, a decade, with so many opinions of mankind about the world. So many different opinions. You know what they're like? Rabbit holes. You know, have you ever seen a rabbit? It goes down a hole this side. It can end up over here. Come up that side. And you can be chasing after rabbit holes for forever. Things that you must hold on to that matter is faith. Faith in Christ Jesus. And your calling. All right. Let's just have a look and see what the... We must just let it go. You know, it, it happens in ministry as well, by the way. This grabbing on, holding on. Taking more, I've got this. Well, then I've got to take this. I'm going, what does that mean? I'm not talking about money again. I'm talking about ministry. Now, who's the ministry? Well, Pastor, you are. Now, yes, I am. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm the, 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 the shepherd of this flock, and, and it's my job to, 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 to shepherd you guys. But each of you are called in ministry. Each one of you. There's not one of you that's not called. Not one. Oh, it's not me because I don't. No, it's, it's all of you. When you become a, a born again, when you become born as a, from, from above, when, you've got, when the Spirit of God enters, you, you have entered ministry. Maybe in different ways, but you have entered ministry because it's your job to... to uh, it was Francis of Assisi who said, at all times preach the gospel, but if necessary, use words. It's the life you lead and the way you lead it. We're all here to, to, to minister, but sometimes we take on too much, and that's the thing. You can take on too much. You can think, oh, well, I've got this going, and I'm praying for that, and I've got to talk to this person. I've got... You take on too much. And I'm not just talking about in the church, and I know that people in this church have taken on a lot of stuff, but don't take on too much. And I'm not just talking about church. I'm talking about your life. I'm talking about things that you feel obligated for. Things that, no, well, I've, I've got to do that because I'm a Christian. You can take on too much. There, are, there is a limit to what you can do that you can do comfortably. If you can't do it comfortably, don't take on. Do you know why? You'll get burnt out. You will burn. You're burning the candles at both ends. Do not do it. You know what? It's okay to say no. It's okay to... You, you, <laughs> it's okay. You know, the, the result... Take a rest. Our role is to love people and to shepherd them, not to fix them. We don't fix people in church. We don't say, all right, come to the church and we will fix what your problem is. Oh, well, I've been uh, drinking for such a long time, and, and uh, we can't fix that. It's your responsibility to call upon whatever tools are available, like the Spirit of God, to pray and to ask him for help with your problem. And I've been smoking drugs or DACA or even tobacco, and I want to get rid of it because I feel that I, that's what I should do. <clears throat> um, can you help me? No, I can't. I can't. Why? It's your responsibility. Who's appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? I'm not going to judge you for whatever you do. But what you must do is take responsibility, right? This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. 
But aren't we supposed to bring everything to Jesus? Jesus said, they turned around to Peter, and he said, who does the people say I am? Peter says, well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Now, at this point, John the Baptist had his head cut off. So if he had been John the Baptist, it would have been a resurrection involved. He says, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Jesus says, that's all right. All right. That, that's, that's, that's who the outsiders say. You will get scoffers out there. You will get people outside who haven't got a clue. Why? Because the truth hasn't been revealed to them. And we know who Jesus is. So Peter, John, Jesus turns around to Peter and he says, but who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus then said, wow. He says, you know what? Flesh and blood, people didn't tell you that. People didn't convince you. People didn't coerce you. People didn't give you such a great sales pitch that you believe it. Only God can reveal faith through revelation. You got the, you got the revelation. And Jesus said to him, upon that revelation, I will build my church. Not upon man. God does not build his churches upon man. He builds his churches upon the revelation of who God is. And that's what, what we've got to go grab. You know, I'm going to build this church. And if we take a, a, a leaf, now let's be honest, we take a leaf out of, out of, out of Jesus' ministry. And, and say, well, what, what was he like with his church? What we was gathering? Of course, he hadn't died yet, but people were following him. But how many? Well, we know there were 5,000 being fed, 5,000 women, 5,000 maybe more children. Could be 15,000 people. And he had this big crowd. What did he do? He sent around, he fed them. He didn't lift an offering. And at the end of it, the next day, he said to them, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, he says, you can't follow me. And they all left. Just like that. Pastors would be giving their eye teeth to have 15,000 people coming in, and they would do all sorts of theological gymnastics to try and keep them there. But Jesus said, unless you are sincere, and unless you were able to drink my blood, take the communion, take, you can't. They left. Jesus turned around to his disciples and said, and you... Peter, what about you? What are you going to do? He says, well, where can I go? In other words, if I had somewhere to go, maybe, maybe I would. Jesus was left with a, at a cross. He was just left with a couple of women at the foot of the cross. But he, didn't, he did not compromise because he was going to build his church on revelation, not on handouts, not on special blessings, not on uh, manifestations of, of things, but on truth. And we've got to look at truth. And, and you know, that's, that's the problem that I find today, that we are, you know, we, we're, we're actually clinging to, to what's not necessary. You see, there's a lot of opinions out there in the world. And I, I'm finding and I see more and more opinions and, and of, of theories of what people think. Now, there, I've got no problem with that. The problem I have is the amount of time that people are using to propagate what they have heard man say. Not God. They're propagating what man has said, and they're building, they're building a house on what man has said. And because they're doing that, it's distracting them away from the path of truth, of Christ. We're here to propagate the kingdom of God. We're not here to prepare the kingdom of God. Christ will do that. We're here to propagate it and tell people what? Gospel. What is that? Good news. When you look at all of these other opinions that are going around, it's not good news. It puts doubt in your mind, and it's got nothing, nothing to do with your salvation. The truth is, Christ crucified. When Jesus said... Nobody pointed me judge or arbiter. He was, he was absolutely 100% right. We've got to take our own responsibilities, but the Bible is very clear. We stay focused and we look at Christ crucified, and what we're called to do is to let all those things go that we're spending or wasting 
wasting time because it's not going to help you for your salvation and it's not going to help other people who read whatever you're putting on. It's not going to help them to get saved. I'm not saying don't ignore the way things are going. We know things aren't great. There are wars in Ukraine. There's going to be famine. There's, see, we see earthquakes. We see floods. We see these things. But Jesus says, when you see these things, you know that the end is near. We should be, we should be sweeping our house out and getting our, ourselves back in order again. Too much being spent. It's not going to help anybody. I'm going to finish with this, this uh, story. And this story that uh, I just want to tell you is the one that we know. It's about uh, Elijah. Remember Elijah? He did all this defeating of the, of the foreign prophets, the false prophets. And then he got scared of Jezebel and he ran away. And then the angel came and got him in the, in the wilderness and by a juniper tree and gave him some food. He got sustained. He was able to make his way back. The angel of the Lord or messenger of the Lord went to him and said, listen, you'll not be able to continue this journey unless you start eating properly. So he said, all right, I'll, I'll eat what I have to eat. And he, he ate it. And then he made his way. The Bible says he made his way to the mountain of God, Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb's other name is Mount Sinai. See, that's where the law was given out. He went in there, went up the mountain, went into a cave, and in the cave he was there. God said to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah came out and he said, yeah, I said, gee, what am I doing here? He says, all the people have rejected your covenant. They've all turned away from you. They're all, I'm the only one left. And now they're hunting me. They want to kill me. All of a sudden, a huge wind broke up. And Elijah was standing at the edge of the cave, and this wind, the Bible says, even was so fierce it broke the rocks. And Elijah just stood. And then an earthquake. And Elijah just stood. And then, I don't know where the fire came from, but it says the fire came out down and bolted all around him. And Elijah didn't move. And then he heard a still, small whisper of God. And he knew it was God speaking to him. Do you know what God said to him? Same thing as he said to him at the beginning. What are you doing here, Elijah? God wasn't distracted by all of the goings on of whatever, all the, all the manifestations going around. Now, if you'd have been in some of the churches, they would have said, oh, that's the Spirit of God. It's, a, it's here. He's doing this. He's doing that. The other. Elijah waited for that little whisper. Elijah wasn't distracted. So God says to him the same question from the beginning. What are you doing here? And Elijah gives the answer. He says, well, your people have rejected your covenant and they're, they're killing them, and they've left you, and I'm the only one left. Elijah didn't change his answer either. He was not distracted by the wind and the fire and the earthquake. We must not get distracted. And when we see things and things that are happening, and do not focus on that. Do not get distracted. You let it go. Let those things go because they're not beneficial to your spiritual life and they're certainly not ben beneficial to your mentality either. Let it go and listen to the whisper that God has got in your ear for your direction because I'm telling you, Christ is standing at the door and he's waiting to come back. Do not look for the Antichrist. The Bible is very clear. He will not be revealed until we are gone. Do not look for tribulation because it will not happen until we are gone. Do not even get involved in that. Do not look for all sorts of theories and, and, and opinions of people because that is not the way to the kingdom of heaven. The, kingdom, the way to the kingdom of heaven is only through faith and revelation in Christ Jesus. Thank you. God bless and amen.